thinking machines. You think the Ixians can produce an artificial intelligence? Conscious the way you are conscious? Are you telling us not to fear the machine? You have the power of reason. Why come begging to me? Do you know what the Ixians boast? That their machine will predict your actions. Is automation synonymous with conscious intelligence? The machine cannot anticipate every problem of importance to humans. It is the difference between serial bits and an unbroken continuum. We have the one. Machines are confined to the other. You still have the power of reason. Intelligence adapts. Intelligence creates. That means you must deal with responses never before imagined. You must confront the new. Conversation between Leto II and the Reverend Mothers, Luceal and Antiac. The backstory of Dune revolves around the Butlerian Jihad, a generational war of extermination of humans against computerized systems, which took place long before the events of the first book. Frank Herbert does not depict these events directly in the original six novels, but the dangers to humanity from artificial intelligence remain a central motif of the Dune series. During Paul's encounter with the Gom Jabbar, Reverend Mother Mohayam tells him, Once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free. But that only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. Dire warnings about the advent of intelligent machines were not new, even in Herbert's day. They have been a mainstay of science fiction for decades. And as early as 1951, Alan Turing, the pioneering computer scientist, theorized that, at some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. In 1965, the year that Dune was published, Turing's associate, I.J. Good, who would go on to consult for Stanley Kubrick's seminal film, 2001 A Space Odyssey, a story that features a supercomputer that turns homicidal, wrote, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. There would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make provided that the machine is docile enough to tell us how to keep it under control. It is curious that this point is made so seldom outside of science fiction. It is sometimes worthwhile to take science fiction seriously. Since then, other well-known scientists and engineers, including Nick Bostrom, Bill Gates and Elon Musk, have publicly voiced their concern that machines will eventually outclass us in their ability to provide for human needs, thus rendering us the subjects of their efforts, redundant. Perhaps most prominently, astrophysicist Stephen Hawking had this to say in a 2014 BBC interview. Artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. It would take off on its own and redesign itself at an ever-increasing rate. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded. In a rebuttal to Hawking, AI researcher and former chief scientist of DARPA's Information Systems Office, Jim Hendler, sounded a more optimistic note. In a 2015 TED Talk, Hendler asserted that human and computer thought were complementary, and that machines would enhance and liberate human potential, particularly by connecting people with similar interests and goals around the world. Now we are looking at a world where computers can bring people together, where groups of people working together can start to attack these very hard problems. We are looking at a world where we have to worry about clean water, clean air, about how we are going to solve climate change. I believe that the only way we are going to solve these problems is putting together teams of the best minds we have, and for the foreseeable future, the best minds will include humans and computers. But can artificial intelligence really be trusted to understand human needs? Or are we just another variable to be manipulated? And does the benefit of human-machine cooperation alone outweigh all of the potential risks, including some that are already being manifested? In a 2017 lecture at the University of Toronto, 
Psychologist Jordan Peterson articulated another factor. AI is already being used to influence human decision-making. Through the accumulation of big data, tech giants provide governments as well as private actors the ability to shape our decisions by feeding us information based on our behavior, thereby corralling us down ever-narrowing corridors. Says Peterson, we are teaching computers to understand us so fast that we really do risk walking into an electronic world where you will only see what you want to see. The marketers are trying like mad to map who you are, even by watching your eyes. But the danger is that will happen, say, in the domain of news or broader information, increasing this tendency of people to be siloed in their exposure to the external world. It's as if each of us is becoming a micro-celebrity, surrounded by electronic sycophants telling us exactly what we want to hear. Jim Hendler frames his argument by claiming that humans can benefit from machines in complex problem solving. And this is, of course, true. But his TED Talk is more of an attempt to sidestep Hawking's central concern that machines will render humanity superfluous than a serious effort to rebut it. Neither does he refute Peterson's concern over a computer-curated information bubble or Bill Joy's fear of an emerging all-powerful technocratic elite. Indeed, when he talks about putting together teams of the best minds we have, and for the foreseeable future the best minds will include humans and computers, he seems to be advocating for the creation of just such an elite, empowered to reorganize society, in order to solve the world's crises for us, rather than with us. Perhaps the mother of all AI critiques was co-founder of Sun Microsystems, Bill Joy's now infamous Wired magazine essay, why the future doesn't need us. In it, Joy argues that given the rise of intelligent robots who can do almost any work that humans do, only faster, better and cheaper, humans will naturally be squeezed out of the marketplace. He suggests that, at that time, one of two possible courses will unfold. 1. We would allow the AI system to manage human affairs for us, autonomously designing ever more complex economic and social systems to maximize human welfare and happiness. 2. Humans would retain some level of control over the AI system, creating a small elite, which would have near total power over the rest of humanity, echoing Jim Hendler's vision and fulfilling Gaius Helen Mohayam's message to Paul that machine intelligence allowed a tiny elite to control the rest of us. Option number one means that we humans lose all control of our destiny. We become as children, enjoying all the comforts that our machine masters lay out for us, but without any purpose or ability to change course. A trap-like scenario resembling the society in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Option 2 makes us slaves to an entrenched technocratic elite, which controls language and thought, and that suppresses any challenge to its power before it even emerges. A world which closely mirrors the one depicted in George Orwell's 1984. In 1974, in a magazine entitled Science Fiction Today and Tomorrow, Frank Herbert wrote, Both George Orwell, author of 1984, and Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World, were concerned with the ability of our democratic institutions to survive the onslaughts of mass automation. They were concerned with their own understanding of that concept we call freedom. In God Emperor of Dune, well after his encounter with the Reverend Mothers Antioch and Lyseel, Leto II reframes his admonition against machines that mimic the human mind to Siona Atreides, during her agony in the deep desert. There's a lesson in that too. What do such machines really do? They increase the number of things. We do without thinking. There's the real danger. Look at how long you walked across this desert without thinking about your face mask. You could have warned me. And increased your dependency. Why would you want me to command your fish speakers? You are an Atreides woman, resourceful and capable of independent thought. You can be truthful just for the sake of truth as you see it. You were bred and trained for command, which means freedom from dependence. Herbert equates dependence on systems we have little direct control over with loss of freedom. The vaster and more complex the system, the less we control our own lives, the less free we become. 
In that sense, it scarcely matters whether a human elite remains in control of the machines. Either way, the human race has lost its autonomy and therefore its ability to adapt. So, how can we address these potential threats? Bill Joy is not optimistic. In his Wired article, he wrote that humanity should pause its feverish push to develop ever more powerful technologies, particularly in the fields of robotics, AI, genetics and nanotechnology. One may perhaps add research on weaponized pathogens to the list. If we could agree as a species what we wanted, where we were headed and why, then we would make our future much less dangerous. Then we might understand what we can and should relinquish. One would think we might be driven to such a dialogue by our instinct for self-preservation. Individuals clearly have this desire, yet as a species, our behavior seems to be not in our favor. In dealing with the nuclear threat, we often spoke dishonestly to ourselves and to each other, thereby greatly increasing the risks. Whether this was politically motivated or because we chose not to think ahead, or because when faced with such grave threats we acted irrationally out of fear, I do not know, but it does not bode well. Frank Herbert seems to have shared Bill Joy's pessimism over shifting the management of human societies to AI, and indeed, the likelihood of a voluntary pause along this path is thin, as big tech forges ahead with its revolutionary machines. This might explain why, in Dune, Frank Herbert thought to resolve the situation through catastrophic warfare, as humans rise up against the machines and those who control them in the great Butlerian Jihad. Historically, when two competing worldviews collide, war is often the final arbiter. Which side is objectively right is another question. <laughs>